Oh, they haven't taken that away from you yet, huh? No, good. I have no idea. Who says there's not luck in football? You are the man. One time, everybody, Donald Trump, unbelievable. Everybody, I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. It's February 13th, 2023. We're live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Locals. Share, subscribe, tap notification bells. And if you want to join us, for the post-game show, which people are really digging. Join us at rubinreport.locals.com. I thought that that was sort of the appropriate cold open for today's show because yesterday was the big Super Bowl, which actually was quite a game. The ending was a little marred with that, uh, that illegal defense call, the pass interference call, but all good. Congratulations to the fine people of Kansas City and the Chiefs and all that good stuff. Um, and of course, what I want to talk about today is if you were watching the commercials, and for many people, for, I'd say for probably half the country or half, half the people watching that freaking thing, uh, they are watching basically for the commercials. One of the things that I really realized, and it probably doesn't come as any great surprise to you guys, is that I am really just so not interested in what the mainstream culture pushes out. It feels so homogenized and boring and everything is a member berry, you know, the South Park member berry meme. Like that's what it is. Everything is like, we have to remember back now. It was very heavy on 80s and 90s references, which I love all that stuff, but it's like going to the well one too many times with washed up actors and old things we used to care of, care for and about. And it just doesn't quite work anymore. And, and just all the pomp and circumstance, the black national anthem, which was completely ridiculous. And if you saw the, at, the, at the end zones, they had the digit, I think it was digitally placed. Do you know if it was digitally placed or it was on the field itself? The end racism in the end zone. So I guess we knocked out racism, which was very exciting. So that was good, at least by doing that. Uh, and then, of course, this morning, all the all the articles across mainstream media, it was the blackest Super Bowl ever. We had two black quarterbacks and racism in the end zone. Rihanna's black, uh, black this. But like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Was the game good? Do you know how to sing, lady? Anyway, the way I wanted to start the show today was a little bit about that one particular commercial that I sense if you watch this show, it got you thinking too. Uh, it was that Disney commercial, The Hundred Years of Disney, which was really a fascinating commercial. And I think it is deeply, deeply connected the way that they uh, put this PR statement out there, this commercial, very different from all of their activities that we've been covering here for well over a year. So we're gonna compare those two things and kind of show you how that's connected to what's going on culturally and politically at the moment. And I think, I think there were a couple other hints yesterday. You can sort of see what the new cultural and political alliance is gonna look like. I think this thing is beginning to form some kind of shape. And I think that's actually quite good for whatever's gonna happen in 2024. Anyway, by the way, one other thing, uh, that cold open there, apparently when Donald Trump threw that football, threw that little hole there, it won somebody a million bucks. That was back in 1992, before he was a white supremacist, I guess. Uh, all right, let's talk about Moink Box real quick and then we'll get to it. Did you guys know that 60% of US pork production comes from one company owned by the Chinese and their hogs are given something called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries, including China, yet you find it in your grocery aisle every day. There's a better way, guys. I want to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste and you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent as well. You choose the meat delivered in every box like ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. Plus you can cancel any time. There's nothing better than cooking their meats on my green egg on a Friday evening. 
Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted, and Ring Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff jumped at the chance to invest in Moink. Plus, they guarantee you'll say, oink, oink, I'm just so happy I got moinked. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash Ruben right now. And listeners of this show get a free filet mignon in every order for a year. That's one of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste. But for a limited time, M-O-I-N-K box.com slash Ruben, moinkbox.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. All right, so let's get to it. Now, you may remember we played one of these clips yesterday. There's a whole slew of Disney Plus shows that are out right now. And as you guys know, the people behind the scenes, the executive producers, the writers, the directors, all of these people, they are woke beyond woke. They are double woke. They are quadruple woke, eight times woke. And they have made it their goal to put their political ideology into children's programming, okay? Now, for a long time, and probably May perhaps forever, artists at some level put some sort of political or cultural message in a painting or in music or in their, the way they act, whatever it might be. That in and of, of itself is actually okay. That, that's the point of good art because it says something that's beyond just looking at the picture, right? That's the actual point of art. Uh, but what these people are doing are putting a political ideology into messaging for young children to change the way they think. And that is very different than why an artist might create art in its purest sense. So before we show you the Disney 100 year anniversary commercial that they showed during the Super Bowl yesterday, this is the thing that they wanted everybody to see on the biggest TV day of the year. I wanna show you one more clip of the new Disney Plus show, Proud Family, uh, which is on right now. I don't have Disney Plus. I canceled it. Do you have Disney Plus? No Disney Plus? Do you, no, no Disney Plus in this room, okay? Uh, but this is Proud Family on Disney Plus. Enjoy. Oh, well, you understand love, don't you? No. No, I do not understand anything about white fragility. White fragility? What's that supposed to mean? You know what it means. You're doing it right now. Doing what? Being defensive about race. Robin D'Angelo wrote a whole book about it. Read it. Yet again. On page 39. Same um, page cover and everything. My dad wouldn't even look at the diary. He said his people would never own slaves. How could he just dismiss me like that? White fertility. Okay, so you must understand, this is not entertainment for children. This is pure propagandic um, disinformation, intentional confusion of children. Why would any child, let's say a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old is watching that. How about entertaining them for the sake of entertainment? Maybe you could teach them something, but to teach them the ideas of white fragility, which is basically the 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 genesis, the beginning of all of what is so wrong with this woke mind disease. And the parents don't even think about it. They just plop that kid down in front of that TV. And by the way, I get the inclination for this. With a six month old and a four month old, one of the few things when, when they're both kind of going nuts at the same time and they're really well behaved, but I've had a couple moments where I've sat them in front of the TV with me. We put on, we put on nature shows, right? We just watch frogs jumping around and some fish and a lion and an elephant, they seem to be big on elephants, but I get the inclination to just put your kid down in front of the TV and then you think, oh, Disney, I have some recollection of Disney being decent. They're not gonna really try to brainwash my child, are they? No, it's Disney of old. Well, speaking of Disney of old, so now let's compare what you just saw of what their current programming is. And you all know, we showed you the interviews and those leaked Zoom videos of the, the activists at the company telling you they are putting their secret agenda into the programming. Now look how different that is compared to Disney's 100th anniversary commercial that they played for the nation to see during the Super Bowl. Open your eyes. Think of the one place you've always wanted to see. It comes from. They say if you dream a thing more than once, please, 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 it's sure to come true. Everything you see exists together in the great circle of life. The 
tell stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. I told you she was tricky. Life is full of possibilities. What do you want to be remembered for? The world is in our hands. And we gotta do something with it. Yes! I just want to say a word of thanks to all the artists, the workers, and all of you. The young and the young at heart. You help make this dream come true. Isn't that interesting, guys? When they want to put the money to make the commercial, to put it on the most watched television thing of the year, there's none of the wokeness. There's no neo-racism. We don't have boy princesses. There's no black woman lecturing a white guy about what he did wrong or what his ancestors did wrong. They went straight up to the heart of why we all once loved Disney for great characters and stories and imagination without getting too critical of it. I, you know, my feelings about what they've done to Star Wars and everything else. Then they bought all of these properties. And I think it is a problem when one giant corporation owns so many of a culture's dreams, say Star Wars, all of Marvel, all the cartoons, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just put that aside for the purpose of this. Why is it that they felt they should pour that money into promoting that? Why, if they are so proud of the woke programming that they're putting out here and that Buzz Lightyear, what happened? He slept with the dude or whatever happened in that last movie and the other thing and, and just these people that are pushing neo-racism on children. Why wasn't any of that in there? Now, I'm going to guess, actually, that uh, Bob Iger, who is the once and current uh, CEO of Disney, that he has a headache on his hands this morning over there at Disney. Because I'm guessing a whole bunch of his woke employees, some of whom we showed you in those leaked uh, Zoom videos, they're, they got to be pretty pissed today. Hey, how come you just went and showed all that old stuff that was probably written by a bunch of white supremacists and didn't have enough of people like us and blah, 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 blah. And now he's got his diversity, uh, equity and inclusion group over there, his HR group, that's probably going to be attacking him. Now, he's gone out of his way to clean up some of that. We showed you a couple of weeks ago a video of him being interviewed saying, hey, we're going to try to get away from some of the political stuff and just entertain people. But again, why would he say that? Why would Disney go out of their way to spend an awful lot of money to ignore the woke stuff and get you to think that Disney is Disney of old? Well, there might be a reason for it because there is this guy here in the free state of Florida who was not happy about any of this nonsense. And he said, no more, Disney, we're taking away your tax breaks. We're taking away some of your self-governing privileges. Uh, we're taking away a whole bunch more from the way you're running Orlando and, and running so many people's lives because you are propagandizing to children. That guy's name is Ron DeSantis. And uh, yeah, he's beaten Disney. And well, listen to the governor himself. Disney's going to pay its debt. And I think if you remember when we did the initial special session where we set the sunset date and we knew we'd have to deal with this. I always said that they're going to come in and we're going to we're going to figure out the best way to do it. Uh, so so what I said really for the last six, nine months is Disney is no longer going to have self-government. They're not going to have their own government. Disney is going to pay its fair share of taxes and Disney's going to honor the debt. And that's exactly what this proposed piece of legislation will do. Uh, if you remember when we first went down this road last spring, a lot of folks in the media were saying that, oh, my gosh, Disney's actually going to pay less taxes and Floridians are going to pay more taxes. They were saying that. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, this puts that to bed. And so those debts will be honored and those will be paid. Now, this is obviously now going to be controlled by the state of Florida, which is no longer self-governing for them. So there's a new sheriff in town. And that's just the way it's going to be. Maybe we'll do some more Florida resident discount. Who knows? All right. So you see what's going on here. This is why I started the show by saying that what is happening right now is we are seeing the cultural and political alliance come together that I think can get us out of this stuff. 
right? It's not nothing that Disney put this commercial up. It's because they're back on their heels because they're losing the tax breaks and the self-governance. And I think they had an airport there that's now not gonna be fully their airport and a whole bunch of other stuff. But the point is DeSantis came in as a political leader, picked a fight that everyone said he was gonna lose. You can look at all of the articles on this thing. You can't beat Disney. Suddenly the lefties who were supposed to be against giant corporations, they were really into giant corporations and Biden was getting up there going, and, and Ron DeSantis is attacking Mickey Mouse. And that's also what Gavin Newsom said. And it's like, no, he's not attacking Mickey Mouse. He's attacking the corporatist people behind Mickey Mouse who have been completely and wholly infected by wokeism, who are trying to destroy families and the brains of children and all sorts of other things. Uh, Disney also, Disney Plus, lost 24 million subscribers last year. I'm one of those subscribers, 2.4 million. So they're doing this commercial because DeSantis chose as a political leader to get involved in the culture wars. And when you start doing that and you start pushing back, their nonsense crumbles rather quickly. Now, one of the advantages that they have is they have the entire mainstream media. So there were a bunch of clips from The View on Friday. I have to show you them. It's, good. it's, several, it's a couple clips here. Just complete insanity going on at The View. And I would love to, can you get me the name of the executive producer of The View? I wanna shout this guy out because I would love to sit down with this guy. I think his name's Brian something. I would love to have this guy on uh, because uh, he is now putting on, I think, probably the most dangerous show on television because it is brainwashing so many women, uh, let's say, of a certain age. His name is Brian Tedda. Brian Tedda, you are the EP of The View. I would love to sit down with you. We can do it live, no notes. Let's talk it out. The, the stark difference between the propaganda that you put out every day and what I try to clean up here every day. So on Friday, The View was going after DeSantis, right? And why are they going after DeSantis? Well, DeSantis just showed you something. He showed if you fight giant corporations and do the right thing, the people will back you. You'll win by 20 points and then you can beat the corporations. The other thing, of course, DeSantis is doing is getting wokeism out of schools. We are not going to teach AP African-American studies to high schoolers who are gonna get college credit for it while also learning about gender queer theory, okay? Obviously these things are not connected and this is to uh, indoctrinate, not educate. So they tried to discuss this on The View and just listen to the litany of nonsense. The sad is all of a certain age. Yeah. Yeah. And they all learned about black history. They all learned it. So I want to know. How do you know that? They, well, because I know that they knew more than there was slaves. They knew the things that some black folks did. Yeah. So I know they learned that. That's what they're trying to suppress. So well, this is what, well, this is what I'm uh -huh. trying to figure out. Uh -huh. What did you learn that scared you so badly that you are trying to remove this from schools now. I, I want to answer your question what it's about. Yeah. What it's about is fanning the flames of anger, grievances, distress, frustration. Ours? In, no, in the base. It's manufacturing culture. Listen, wars. the base <laughs> needs to understand everybody's pissed about something. You know, the last three or four years have not been great for everybody and possibly for anybody. How dare you use that, your anger, <clears throat> to pretend an entire section of the United States doesn't exist. I'm gonna get you to the part that's really incredible in just a second, but I, we really need a phrase for Whoopi, or maybe Whoopi should be, we should use it in a different way as just instead of her name. Like to Whoopi is to just bloviate on a bunch of nonsense you have no idea about. They are not trying to remove the history of slavery or of civil rights from high school or junior high school or anywhere else in Florida. They are specifically going after one AP course, which would be taught in high school to give college credit to kids, where part of the course itself will teach critical race theory. We'll get to that in a second. Part of it will teach about the importance of reparations. That's teaching policy, future policy to kids. That's not right. And also gender queer theory. Did Harriet Tubman go down on a couple chicks while she was getting them through the Underground Railroad? There's a sentence that's never been said before. 
but it continues. Now you also have to remember as you watch this clip, so Whoopi, Whoopi is just Whoopi. She has no idea what she's saying, but she says it with a lot of emotion, and that is really good for, for leftists. They love emotion over anything that has to do with reality. Then Anna Navarro there, and Anna used to be a sane Republican. She worked for, I believe she was Marco Rubio, right here in Florida. She was Marco Rubio's campaign manager. And now she is just another crazy person that somehow she's telling you the whole base of her former party, or I think she still pretends to be a Republican, uh, is all a bunch of racist. Yet somehow they were supporting Marco Rubio, I'm pretty sure he's not white, uh, and everything else. And then here we go. Here's Alyssa Farah. This is, she's really, you know, Sonny Hostin, you know my feelings on her. Like she's just like a genuine racist and awful. Just like, they're just so bad. Okay, fine. Al Alyssa Farah though, Alyssa Farah Griffin, her name is. She used to work for Mitt Romney. She is the token conservative on this panel. And what she doesn't seem to understand is for the, I don't know how many, they probably give her about $3 million a year to be on, to host that show, something like that, a couple of years. So you're gonna make some serious cash on that thing. What she doesn't realize is no matter how much she sells her soul, Joy and Whoopi and Anna, the rest of them, they will still sell her out one day. They will still destroy her. This will not end well. These people will not be her friends. Everyone will turn against her. And yes, she'll have a little cash. And I hope it's worth it for her. Uh, but now it's where it starts getting crazy. And you can see how I'm connecting this to culture, Disney, politics, DeSantis, and media. Take a look. Yeah, it's really important. What Ron DeSantis did with banning AP Black History, that is going way further than what many members of my party have, have raised concerns with. So there's a lot of parents who get concerned with elements of critical race theory getting into Listen, school. Listen, I'm, go I'm gonna say this one more time. Elements of critical race theory are not taught to five-year-olds. Not. It's not taught to eight-year-olds, not taught to 10-year-olds. The 10-year-olds learn. Listen, but you know what? If you're scared of American history, I. I don't get it. But the, I yeah. do think it's an important distinction because what he's doing is so absurd and it's going so far. You're literally talking about erasing history, not bringing in the theories and the theoreticals and the mm -hmm. more college level the stuff that's in CRT. And how this reformed. is straight up saying, we're not gonna learn about slavery. We're not gonna learn about the Civil right. War. That's also that's happening much in more Texas dangerous. as well. I just wanna like, kind of separate those two. Not that both don't deserve to be discussed, but that's going dangerously far. I don't know that Sarah or anyone, I think Texas she might be doing Sarah it. I don't think Sanders. Arkansas. Yeah. Me. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I don't think Arkansas is trying to do quite that yet. Okay, first off, let me just talk to you, Alyssa. We're gonna clip this and put it on Twitter and I'm gonna tag Alyssa. Alyssa, by the way, shuts off all her mentions because nobody likes her and uh, she doesn't wanna read that and I get why they don't like her because she's a liar. She, she we, you know, we say the word grifter a lot or sellout. I, I can't imagine at this point someone that's doing it at a higher level than her, like maybe her former boss, Mitt Romney, like something like that. But everything she said there was a lie. They are not banning talk about slavery. They are not banning talk about civil rights. Whoopi, once again, just whoopied the whole thing, meaning she just completely made things up. AP courses, which is, that's what this is about, are not taught to five-year-olds or six-year-olds or eight-year-olds. They're still gonna learn about all of those things and get an honest assessment of history. They are gonna get educated about history instead of indoctrinated about history. But this Pharaoh woman, she's either a complete idiot or a grifter. There's no way, there's no in between there. And, and I suspect she's not a complete idiot. So what she is doing is saying, I will take a certain amount of money to sit at this table to lie about the people that are defending the ideals that me as a supposed conservative are, is, are supposed to believe in. That's exactly what she is doing. She is ridiculous and a buffoon. This has nothing to do with racism. You tell me what gender queer theory has to do with an honest assessment of civil rights. Absolutely nothing. Ben Shapiro has an interesting line on this that I thought was apropos. Put this tweet up. Uh, he's talking about this Lizzo flute controversy. Now, you may remember a couple weeks ago, Lizzo, who is this tremendously giant woman, who I guess is a singer. She's a singer or, a, yeah, she's a singer, okay. And she, she's huge, this woman, and, and she loves being huge, so I'm not even making fun of her. She is a giant, tremendous, huge woman. She wears skimpy little bikinis. She plays the flute. Anyway, here's what Ben said about it, and you'll see how I'm connecting these things. This Lizzo flute controversy is a perfect example of what I have termed face tattoo phenomenon. The phenomenon whereby someone does something deliberately controversial in an attempt to draw attention and then acts offended when 
you notice. This is exactly what these people have been doing. They get in your face and say, we are going to teach African-American history. We are gonna combine it. There's no problem in and of itself with that. We are gonna combine that with gender queer theory. This is gonna be an extension of critical race theory and it's going to, yes, whoopee, even though AP courses aren't taught to five-year-olds, all of this stuff is going to leak down into every age that every child is at at school and it will still be pushed by Disney. See the videos that we just showed you a moment ago and every cultural thing will infect them and ed every educational institution will infect them and all of the stuff. So, but this is exactly what they do. And this is what Ben is referring to because then when you push back, they get the reaction that they want because then they are the victim and they love that. So that is why they hate DeSantis. What DeSantis is doing, all he is doing, he's doing two things. I would say he's saying, stop, enough is enough. That's the first thing. And that's the most important thing because we're always on this slow descent to woke hell and we keep going and going and going and we have been waiting for a couple people. You know, picture it, it's a, it's a train, right? It's a train going down a track. You got the ravine over there and you're just going and going and going and you're, you, you know the ravine's coming, but, and every now and again, so slow down, speed bump ahead, but you need somebody to say, stop. You are going to go off into the ravine. This will not end well for any of you. You are going to undo everything that is great about this country. I get it, they don't think the stuff is that great. For some reason, they never leave. DeSantis is saying, stop, that's number one. Okay, so he's getting the train to stop. And then what's he doing? Then he's pulling the curtain back. And he's saying, guys, explain to me how gender queer theory has something to do with African-American studies. Explain to me why Disney, a giant corporation, deserves all of these extra benefits and can basically be running its own country within our state. And by doing that, by just exposing the nonsense, he has the liars, the frauds, the grifters, he has them all freaking out to the point that someone like Alyssa Farah Griffin is up there on The View taking money to lie about the Republicans and conservatives. Whoopi is just brain dead. She, and, and so is Joy. They, they are lost and confused. They will never turn around, right? This is where I can make a complete distinction between say a whoopee and a joy. They are all in on the nonsense versus someone like Bill Maher who still is getting half of it right. He hasn't gotten there on the election part of it, but he's getting a whole bunch right still. These people are encouraging the lunacy and now you have these fraud people on the right encouraging it as well. And that is why they hate DeSantis. And here's DeSantis himself laying out why this course is not gonna be taught here in Florida. What's one of the lessons about queer theory? Now, who would say that an important part of black history is queer theory? That is somebody pushing an agenda on our kids. And so when you look to see they have stuff about intersectionality, abolishing prisons, that's a political agenda. And so we're on, that's the wrong side of the line for Florida standards. Right. I don't think that queer theory has anything to do with African-American studies. I was thinking about it while we were playing that clip. Uh, you remember in Revenge of the Nerds, there was Larry B. Scott, and he was the gay guy in the fraternity with the javelin. So unless you're gonna teach a course on him, which I do think would be completely legitimate as a child of the 80s, then this is all complete nonsense. But let's link this further to what's going on politically and culturally right now. Uh, one of the fights that's happening is a fight that obviously has been looming. This thing is coming. Right now it's a one-way fight and the media is loving every freaking second of it. Uh, and of course, what I'm talking about is the uh, DeSantis-Trump fight. Now, it seems to be a one-way fight, as I said, because Trump is the one going on the attack. DeSantis is kind of just standing there continuing to govern. Let me give you the caveats. I voted for Trump. I want to interview him again. I like him. I like his children. However, his behavior over the last couple weeks has been really, really bananas. And I would say DeSantis is basically giving a master class in how to fight it off. You know, we've seen Trump do a lot of crazy things over the years. A lot of them I think were absolutely necessary to break through the bullshit. Uh, so a lot of the lock her up, a lot of that stuff, it was, it was necessary to, to shake the system in a way. So we owe Trump to, we owe him because he doled out red pills to everybody. He got us to see again, that behind that curtain thing that I talked about with DeSantis a moment ago, Trump did that better than anybody. 
Um, but we, but we also saw him use tactics, you know, little Marco, and he said Ted Cruz's wife is ugly, and like all of these things, and nobody's loyal to him, but he throws all of his ex people under the bus. Anyway, he's going overboard in his attacks on DeSantis, like unnecessarily overboard. Considering that he backed DeSantis, he claims that he made DeSantis, he lives in the state that DeSantis is governing right now. And DeSantis, obviously, even though he has not announced, and I have to tell you, I talked about it a lot with a couple of people this weekend. Let me just, cards on the table, for real guys, there is a huge part of me that does not want DeSantis to run. And in some ways, it's even the bigger part of me than the part that, that thinks that we should turn this whole country around. Meaning, I live in the state that is the most functional, competent state. We have the best head executive. His work has just begun. He's continuing to do everything. And we could use four more years of him doing all of these great things. The real question is, do you send your best soldier out? There is a war. There is a war brewing or a coming, or it's the barbarians are at the gate. Do you send your best guy out knowing that maybe the war can't be won. Maybe the machine is that powerful. Maybe Trump is willing to do things that would be that evil and irreparably harm him and all of those things. So I think there is a strong, I really mean this, there is a strong, strong argument for DeSantis to stay right here. And maybe as a Floridian, I just should not care that much about the grander experiment at this point. I'm not saying that's fully where I'm at, but I think there is a strong argument to be made on that. But I do for sure think that DeSantis would be the best president, and I certainly think he is the biggest threat to the system because he is Trump, but competent. Okay, so putting just all of that out there, just put that in a little bucket for a moment. Here's a couple things that Trump has been doing, uh, and you tell me if, you, if, you, if this feels right to you, if you think this is gonna work, and just pointing out once again, we don't even know if DeSantis is gonna run, and this is extremely early, so it seems like you're throwing the kitchen sink out at this point. Here's, uh, here's Trump on Truth Social. Apparently, some random person, Dong Chang Lee, uh, found on Truth Social, found this picture. We're told that apparently this is Ron DeSantis at some point, I don't know, and it says here is Ron DeSanctimonious, worst nickname ever, it's not sticking, grooming high school girls with alcohol as a teacher. Okay, first off, it's not clear if that's doctored or not. Secondly, um, it could be non-alcoholic beer. It could be root beer. We don't know what the hell it is. There's no, none of these girls have come. Like, it's it, even sh to me talking about this, in some ways I'm doing Trump's dirty work here, which I don't like. But the point is, does anyone think that that's really a, rep a, a good representation of the life that Ron DeSantis is living? And did, did all of us do crazy things in college and all of that stuff? But he's doing that kind of thing. And, and what, oh, so just put it up one more time. So what he, what Trump added to it was, that's not Ron, is it? He would never do such a thing. I mean, this is Donald Trump, grab him by the pussy. So it's like, is this the game you want to play, man? Is this the game you want to play? So DeSantis is wisely just playing this thing real cool. Take a look. And I'd also just say this. I spend my time delivering results for the people of Florida and fighting against Joe Biden. That's how I spend my time. <laughs> I don't spend my time trying to smear other Republicans. Yeah, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. I'm here to do a job and I'm doing that job and I'm doing it better than anybody and you backed me and you live in my state. And I don't think anyone wants that crap. One of the things that's interesting and Trump has done a few of these types of messages. I'm, I'm actually sort of sorry I even showed it because it, it, it butterfly affects the thing. And it's just nonsense, it's not going anywhere, okay, fine. Um, but Trump, if you're willing to take out the guy who probably is the best guy we've got, then are you really America first at that point? That's the question. Now, interestingly, I wanna link this uh, to the guy I mentioned a moment ago, Bill Maher, because on his show on Friday, he had a rather curious statement related to what's going on with DeSantis and Trump. And I think he sort of almost accidentally made the argument that I've been making for quite some time. So here's this from Fox News. Real-time host Bill Maher advised Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to avoid the battle in the mud with former President Donald Trump in the 2024 election cycle, as reports indicate he will enter the race for the White House. 
I personally think that would be a mistake for him, Marr began a panel discussion on Friday, because he's 46, I think. Just let Trump die, politically, I mean, or, you know, he's older. It could happen, I'm not wishing it, but okay. He'd still only be 50. Marr continued, if DeSantis got in against Trump, Trump will do to him what he does to everybody, not just bloody him. It'll be a battle in the mud and all DeSantis has to do is wait and he can be president. I normally would say the opposite, get in early before they pick you apart, but in this case with Trump, it changes everything. GOP pollster Kristen Soltis Anderson compared running against Trump to running into a wood chipper, but disagreed with Marr that DeSantis should wait it out since this is his moment. You don't get your moment all the time in American politics, Soltis Anderson said. So what's interesting about this, guys, and, and again, you know my feelings about Marr, so we don't have to, you know, we don't have to rehash that. It only is worth listening to Marr's opinion on this if Marr honestly was going to vote for DeSantis. But I think, sadly, what Marr is doing there, and again, I saw him last week. I like the guy, so this is not a personal attack, Bill. And I'm, we're going to play basketball at your house, okay. This is not a personal attack, but I am fairly certain no matter whether it's Trump or DeSantis, you're gonna vote for the Democrat. So really what you are doing here is saying much more about your intentions. You want the weaker candidate to run on the Republican side and you view the weaker candidate as Trump, which actually is correct. DeSantis is the guy that can bring the moderates. DeSantis is the guy that can bring the, the disaffected liberals and young people, like we know, who's the new person that's gonna suddenly move to Trump? So Mars doing something, it's like, it, you're advising DeSantis, but I would only take, if I was DeSantis, I would only take advice from people that wanna help me, not people that wanna kneecap me. And that is the problem with what Bill Maher's line of thinking there is. Although, as you guys know, when I did Bill Maher's podcast, I got him to admit he would move to Florida if California ever came crashing down again when it comes to lockdowns and mandates and all of that stuff. Um, but I think you see it. Bill Maher, again, this is a guy that a week before the election was saying, if you, if you, you know, for all the stuff he gets right on wokeness and free speech and all that stuff, he basically two, three days before the midterms was saying, if you want to save democracy, you got to vote for Democrats. So why would DeSantis or any sane Republican take uh, his advice? I just don't know. But okay, where does that lead us? Well, 2024 is a coming. And apparently because Joe Biden did not fall off the stage the other day at the State of the Union, did not knock the podium over and have his eyeball explode, uh, everybody's saying he's gonna run again because yes, that really makes sense. We should have 83, well, he'll be 83 year old Joe Biden. Man cannot complete a sentence. There is zero chance they let him hold a phone, has no idea what he is doing. Occasionally they can drug him with something really special. I'll have what she's having uh, so that he can get out there and pretend that he's functional. Apparently he's gonna run again. Here's Corinne Jean-Pierre. Okay, say the union is over. When are we gonna hear the, the, the big speech, the Biden-Harris 2024 announcement? So, as you know, I am, I am limited in what I can say. I can't talk about politics. I am covered by, ha by the Hatch Act. But what I can say is repeat what the president has said many times is that he intends to run. I leave it there. I just don't even know what to say about it. It's like we're watching such a poorly written script, but we're all stuck in it. Like, is that what we need again and again? Think about how the world is changing the speed with which technology is changing us, how everything is so wildly different than when Joe Biden got involved in politics 50 years ago, and he somehow never solved racism, and he never got anything close to world peace or any of those things, but he's the best they got at this point. I mean, what is going on? And, and okay, Corinne Jean-Pierre, all she does, she has nothing, she can't comment about politics, she can't say anything honestly, Saki's gonna circle back. Listen to this little piece of wizardly wisdom from Corinne. Why is, why is the American military shooting something out of the sky over Canada? Because it's part of a NORAD. There is a, the NORAD is part of like a, it, part of a, it, it's a, it's a, what you call a coalition, a consortium, a consortium, a, 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 pact so, of a pact, okay. exactly. And so that's why we were able to do that. Again, it, we didn't do it on our own. We did right. it in, in, uh, in uh, it clearly in, 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 in step with uh, right. Canada. Canada. Uh, Canadia, we did it with Canadia people. She's an idiot. I mean, she has no idea what she's saying. She moves her, she's doing this a lot because she's trying to put words together. Because what do I always say to her? She's just picking words and she grabs words from thin air and she puts them into a sentence. She could not 
tell you what NORAD is. He had to kind of walk her there. And Canada is always at war with East Asia. You get it. All right. Uh, but why are we left with these people? Why are we left with a president who's barely functioning, a press secretary who can't say anything honestly, members of the media like at the televised mental institution, MSNBC, who lie about everything, but also promote a certain point of view, sometimes outwardly, sometimes very subtly. Why are we left with them? Because the machine itself incentivizes it. And why does it incentivize it? Because if you give the machine whatever it wants, meaning if you give it more attention and more tax dollars and more money and power over people's lives, that's what the machine wants. I don't know exactly what the machine is. It's like, it's like asking somebody, what is the meaning of life? In the most, and give me it in one sentence. So I don't know what the machine is. Is it part of all of us that allows this to happen? Is it, is it Bill Gates and a group of shadowy people? Is it some amalgamation of like a lot of different things probably? Uh, but, but if you are on the side of always taking more money, if you are on the side of always forcing people to inject themselves with things or locking down, if you're on the side of big government and big tech, then you will be incentivized. A guy like Stephen Colbert, if you give the machine what it wants, Jimmy Kimmel, give the machine what it wants. Uh, the other one, uh, Jimmy, who's the other one? Not Jimmy Fallon, yeah, Jimmy Fallon. You'll do your stupid COVID dance because you're not a comedian, you're just this little tool who gives the machine what it wants and you do it for an awful lot of money, right? I don't think everything is boiled down to money always, but there's a certain set of people that it does. Alyssa Griffin Farrah, or Farrah Griffin, whatever the hell her name is. It's like, lady, you have sold out every one of your ideas, every one of the things that you purported to believe in uh, so that you can have money and fame and congratulations, you got it. It's going to destroy you. I'm sorry, can't help you, uh, but there we go. So the machine incentivizes it. Uh, and that brings us to another thing that's going on right now, which is that we are finding out not only through the Twitter files, uh, but through some congressional hearings lately. And you, we showed you a couple clips last week, Jim Jordan doing a bang up job at those hearings, Lauren Boebert doing a bang up job at those hearings, going after Twitter executives. As I said to you guys, they're going to have to go after FBI agents as well. Like if we're going to do anything about any of this, somebody's going to have to pay the price. Otherwise, otherwise the rest of us the same middle, the rest of the people that are watching the show are just gonna tune out of the show because none of it will make sense anymore. Oh, we just have hearings and nothing ever happens. Anyway, one of the people that has been fighting a lot of this stuff, guess what guys? She was a Democrat, Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, she ran for president as a Democrat. And what did the Democrat party do? It tried to destroy her. What did media do? It tried to paint her as a, a Syrian ally or an ally of Assad in Syria and anti-American. She's a member of our military, a current member of our military still to this day. Anyway, she testified uh, in Congress about how government and big tech are basically silencing you. To see and say under the guise of protecting us from so-called misinformation or disinformation. Now, of course, they appoint themselves as the sole authority and voice of truth, of information, backed by the most lethal force on earth with the power to target anyone they deem a threat. They alone are the ones, self-designated, who get to decide what is true and what is false, what is information and what is misinformation or disinformation. They say they're doing this for us, that they're doing this for our own good, to protect the people. But in reality, the truth is they think that we're too stupid to think for ourselves, too stupid to discern for ourselves and to draw our own conclusions. Now, the idea that we must just blindly accept whatever the government or those in power tell us is true goes against the very essence of our Constitution and Bill of Rights, which were created as a resounding rejection of the reign of kings, churches, and authorities. They tell us we must blindly trust them or face the consequences. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you guys are on board everything she said right there. Really just think for one moment how different so much could be had the Democrats, when they all cashed in their chips and cut their backdoor deals to let Biden be president and they all got out of the way, Tulsi stuck around and did not cut a deal. She was the last Democrat still going against Biden and then eventually they kicked her to the side too. But imagine had they, instead of cutting a deal with Kamala, whatever that match made in hell is all about, Imagine if they had cut a deal with Tulsi and said, Tulsi, actually some of your populism stuff, some of your non-radicalism, you're, you're a lefty, you're a liberal for sure, abortion, gun rights, okay, stuff like that. 
Uh, but you're not like totally on board our radical agenda, but we will bring you into the fold here and maybe that would help moderate us a little bit, get some of that sane center back, say the old school liberals would be more okay with the Democrat party. But instead, uh, you had Hillary Clinton literally uh, calling her a spy and uh, Mitt Romney calling her treasonous. She actually talked about that. More recently, U.S. Senator Mitt Romney accused me of treason, a crime that is punishable by death under our laws. I challenged him to back this, back this serious allegation up with evidence. What was this based on? There was no response, no explanation, no evidence, and certainly no apology. Now, these accusations are often shrugged off as, well, hey, it's politics. People say things about each other all the time. Now, that may be easy for some of you to say, but for somebody who wears the uniform, this is serious. And it's serious not only to me, but to my fellow service members and veterans, every one of us making a decision at some point in our lives to raise our right hand, prepared and volunteering to lay our life down for this country. I love what she said right there because she's connecting her political service to her military service. And when you, as she points out, when you go into the military, you don't know if you're coming back alive. You don't know if you're coming back maimed or wounded. You don't know what mission they're gonna send you out on. And when you go up there as a politician, you know they're gonna say the worst things about you. But really think about it. When that woman, Tulsi Gabbard, was running for president, Hillary Clinton literally said she was a Russian asset. And nobody called Hillary out on it. It was just, oh, oh, that's what Hillary said. You're allowed to do that. And that's what Tulsi's saying. It's like, you can say these things in politics. Mitt Romney had no reason to believe that Tulsi is treasonous. Tulsi just doesn't buy the uniparty stuff that you believe in. I mean, Romney, you pretend you're a Republican, but you, you're really a Democrat, obviously. And it's kind of funny because we can link that to the girl that used to work for you, Alyssa Farrah Griffin. I mean, this is these people, the machine loves Republicans who are really Democrats, right? So if you are a Republican, if you're a Republican, quote unquote, who will go on TV and constantly bash and lie about your own side, they love you, whether that's Mitt Romney, whether that's Liz Cheney. And by the way, the woman that they flashed to, you probably recognized her while Tulsi was speaking, was Congresswoman Harriet Hageman, who we've had on the show before, uh, who replaced Liz Cheney, a Republican who would only go on TV and be lauded and applauded because she would attack Republicans. So this is how the machine operates. The machine operates by always running cover for the Democrats, bringing on Republicans who will take out their side and then hiding Democrats when need be. So over the last, I don't know, it's gotta be decade or so, uh, Fox has done interviews with uh, the various presidents, whether it was Obama, whether it was Trump. Uh, Bill O'Reilly did a bunch of them. Uh, there were several people, several, several interviewers that interviewed the presidents during the Super Bowl. Joe Biden declined to be on Fox News or to decline the Fox interview. So it would have aired at halftime. He declined, oh, no, they would have aired it right before the game. Sorry, I think it was before the game. Um, he declined to do it. And now here is Oliver Darcy at CNN. And this guy, Oliver Darcy, he replaced disgraced potato. Uh, what the hell is his name? Brian Stelter. God, these people, like, why do I have to know all these people's names? Remember potato Brian Stelter? Yeah, he was the host of Reliable Sources, of course. This guy, Darcy, who's just a total tool too. You'll see him in a second. He replaces him at Reliable Sources. And here he is holding water, running cover for Biden because Biden might have had a bit of a tough interview if he had actually sat down with someone at Fox News. President, this current president doesn't want to do it. Maybe future presidents won't want to do it. Yeah, Jim, I think this really underscores um, the level of commitment uh, Biden has showed to icing out Fox. As you, as you said, he hasn't granted uh, this right-wing talk channel uh, any interview since he's been president. And you can imagine why. I mean, if you watch this channel, it, it's very clear there's a, there's a strong animus toward him, toward his administration. And at nighttime, you have extremists, people like Tucker Carlson, who are going on, on these rants, who are spreading misinformation and conspiracy theories about uh, things from the vaccines to January 6th. And so I think for this president, he has decided you know, he's not going to call out the channel. He's not going to go to war with it in that way, but he's not going to give it any credence by appearing on. My buddy Viva Fry, who we had on the show, what was it, last Friday? Confession through projection, right? Everything they say is true about them. 
First off, it's Biden's commitment. It's, it's really his commitment to the truth. That's why he won't go on Fox News. And you know, it's not as if he's going to be asked hard questions, right? They would have put Brett Baer up there or something like that. He would have got a couple, maybe slightly, maybe, maybe slightly. But they also edit everything Biden says. He's never going to do a live interview again. Remember when he almost had that complete full-on mental breakdown when he was doing that town hall with Anderson Cooper and Anderson was basically finishing his sentences the entire time? So he obviously would have done. They wouldn't have been taping it live to tape at exactly, you know, 6.15 before the game. This would have been something that would have been taped and edited. They would have had agreements before that when he starts talking about corn pop and his hairy leg, we're going to we're gonna edit that out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, he talked this, this idea that it's Fox. It's somehow Fox who are the extremists and they're sharing the misinformation about vaccines. You guys, you CNN clowns, you shared all of the misinformation about vaccines and cheered on vaccines that you had no idea whether they were gonna work or not. Turns out that they don't work. And you guys shared all the lies about January 6th, the insurrection, nobody had plans, nobody had guns. It's so bizarre. So everything they say is the reverse of the truth. But you know what happens? You know what happens when you have crappy garbage, crappy garbage coming out of CNN and MSNBC and NBC and ABC and CBS and everything else? People start looking for something a little more true. And then it not just leaks through the, the news portion of this, it leaks through all of the entertainment side of this thing, which is why a couple times in the last few weeks I've brought up, is The View considered an entertainment show or a news show? But what this wokeism does, what this allegiance to the uniparty does, is basically cause everything to be fraudulent and a lie. So it ruins them sort of journalistically, their inability to say anything true because they're always trying to point you in one direction, but it also ruins their ability to create anything good. That's why we don't have good new music. It's why we don't have good new TV shows and movies. Sometimes every now and again, something can skate through every now and again, but it's certainly why we haven't had good comedy in a while. Uh, we really have not, at least at the at least at the television level. I've no doubt people are doing live things that are good. And when we were out on tour, we're getting lots of laughs. Okay, uh, but what does it all cause? Well, if you put out a bunch of cookie cutter carbon copies of themselves on late night TV, you know who becomes number one in late night? A guy by the name of Greg Gutfeld, who has three writers, and I'm pretty sure one other guy that works on the show, I predicted on the debut of the Gutfeld Evening Show, which I was on, I said, you will be number one in late night. I think we said within six months, he made it in three months. They aired a, a quick spot during the Super Bowl. I just wanted to throw to that. Gutfeld, new king of late night commercial, ready to roll. Isn't this great? Is this cultural appropriation? <laughs> Action. Hello, America. That's a wrap. What? Sorry, these ads are pricey. And that's like perfect of why Gutfeld is who he is at this point and why the shows work. And like whatever they paid for that doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter if you think it's funny or not. The point is he's doing something a little different and people have had enough of it. So how do I link this again to where we started at the beginning? This cultural and political alliance that is coming together. It's starting to take shape. We can kind of see it. Well, this is interesting. Look who is sitting in the same box at the Super Bowl. Well, you've got some brilliant minds in that photo. Rupert Murdoch, Elizabeth Murdoch, Elon Musk. Rupert pays our checks too, so that's always good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, everyone take it in Super Bowl 50. Well, isn't that something? Rupert Murdoch, owner of Fox, sitting with Elon. Something's starting to cook. Elon bought Twitter. All of these pieces are kind of presenting itself. And now let me just do a little pat on the back. The Spectator had a really nice piece uh, this weekend that I was included in. And I thought it was apropos of everything we're talking about here. Here's a little quote from the piece. Uh, For several decades, Rush Limbaugh used radio to present a conservative analysis of current affairs to millions of Americans. Today, a new generation of commenters has emerged, achieving with the new media what Rush using radio. Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, and Dennis Prager each have acquired audiences of millions. In Britain, assorted YouTubers have achieved something similar. But is there not a danger that these new media pundits are speaking to an audience that already agrees with them? Such is the fragmented nature of the modern media market. There is little prospect of reaching beyond those that already subscribe to their worldview the way that Rush Limbaugh's ubiquitous broadcasts were able to. How can we reach beyond those that already agree with us? Guys, That the reason I left that part in there is because that has been my mission all along, my life. 
literally my life, my day-to-day -day operation over these past however many years that you've known me has been an example of not only moving, if you look at my bio and everything else, it's like, that's a guy that should live in Cali, but moving to Florida and sure, having some differences with some people and maybe somebody's not thrilled with this or that about me, but putting together this new coalition of people, right? That's why I talk about the libertarians and the ex-libs and the religious conservatives and the new school conservatives and all of these things to put them together because that is the tapestry of America. And that is why I love when I look in the comment section and see that some of you disagree with me on this or that, or I don't sit here and pretend to tell you that I and I alone know the truth, right? I leave some things with unanswered questions so that you guys can think about it too. And, we, and then we can all kind of play it out together and figure out what's what. So I would never want to be in that, in that sense of an echo chamber. It's, it's tough. It is harder and harder as the, you know, obviously I focus more now on, on doing this show, meaning the, the direct to camera, talking to you, sharing the news with you than I do on the interviews. We're doing one or two interviews a week. But part of the reason was because it also became basically impossible to find people that would sit down with me that disagreed with me on things. Uh, that, that, were, that had legitimate backgrounds or something. Like I can find some random hater on YouTube that would love to come on here and yell at me. Um, but because the left has become so crazy and because if you sit down with someone who doesn't agree with us on this, then you are like them too. It became harder and harder to do that. So I will always, always look for those other avenues to find new people in this thing. And I can just tell you guys, after touring, on this last book and, and everything I've done and the amount of email I get. I mean, the, the amount of people who disagree on a whole bunch of things and are still here because we love America, we love freedom, we don't wanna give this thing away and we wanna stop what is the greatest threat, which is this confluence of wokeism and the uniparty and the globalists and all these things. It's like, I'll, I'll take that bet. I'll take that bet that we can do it, I really will. Guys, it's me Monday over at the Locals Community. Here's what I put up. 2021, if anyone refuses the COVID shot, they should be fired. Put in camps, have their kids taken, be denied medical care and left to die. 2022, we were all misinformed. Let's just forgive each other and forget about it. We'll find out what 2023 brings on that, but uh, a couple hundred people already have put in some comments. So please jump in and do that. And now if you'd like to join us for the post game show, lots of people have been joining. Uh, we take some questions, some comments, and a bunch more. Uh, you can join us in about 30 seconds at rubenreport.locals.com. And my full interview with Dr. Robert Malone, you guys know Malone. He is the doctor that owns more mRNA patents than anybody, basically invented mRNA technology and has become probably the premier voice in warning against these vaccines. Think about that. Uh, part of that full interview is up right now, so you can check that out. Uh, we will be back with the post-game show momentarily. Have a great Monday, everybody. Joining us tonight is a father named Doug. He wrote Jill, my wife, a letter. Anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. It's such a heinous act. should have never happened. It is not fair.